Hi, this is Cece Kim and this is Jim Bacho for Movies About Music. And what movie did we watch this time? We watched Mr. Holland's Opus today. And this was your recommendation. Yes, because I had seen it when it had come out, which was, I think it was 1995. I think it's a 1995 film, yeah. Mm-hmm. I wanted to, I, I was deeply touched by this movie when I was 12 years old. And I wanted to revisit it as an, a 38-year-old adult. And I've never seen this movie, which surprises myself, actually. I don't know why I didn't see this movie. So we're talking about 1995. Yes. And I do remember it being a big deal. Hmm. And it being the movie that everybody has to see. Hmm. And I don't know why I didn't see it. I think in 95, I was like, you know, sort of this raging 20-something probably wasn't my taste at the time. So I somehow missed it. And then and then what happens with these movies a lot of the time is they take on their own life and you hear so much about them that you're like, nah, I, I, I'm going to pass on that. Mm-hmm. Well, I feel like it's important to address that when you're, I think, in your mid-20s, you miss out on a lot of mainstream movies because you think you're just like too cool for the world. That's true. That's that, how I felt when I was in my mid-20s. Yeah. I was exclusively watching um, Godard movies. <laughs> <laughs> this is why I like you. <laughs> when I, because I thought I was just so cool. Yeah, I and, think the same. Yeah. <laughs> like the There's same something way. about that age. Yeah, that's right? true. When you're in your 20s, you sort of want to say, you know, screw culture and I'm going to find my own way. And yeah. Whatever's popular, you're not going to yeah. be involved with. Yeah, I think I was, uh, I, you know, I was pretending to enjoy like Tchaikovsky or whatever. And uh, until I actually enjoyed them. But I don't watch it anymore. Like, I don't watch these art films. I don't watch Nouvelle Vague anymore. Yeah, I, I do. I know you do. <laughs> but I think there's something about that age where you're kind of exploring, you know, being cool or whatever. Right, right. But, and yet, you, um, this was your recommendation. So I'm curious why you recommended mm-hmm. this film for us. So... I wanted to revisit this movie because it's a movie about music for sure. Definitely. And it's um and specifically it's about it's a movie about a musician who didn't necessarily quote unquote make it as a musician, right? Mm. Um it's about a teacher, a high school music teacher who takes on this gig as a teacher temporarily just to see how it goes. Right. And then ends up doing it for the rest of his life right 30 years i think i'm fascinated more and more of of stories about people who are brilliant and didn't make it you were talking about this um in another context you were like imagine all those people the weirdos who we never heard of right yeah i remember we were having a conversation um just about the because so many of these movies and these stories that you hear about people is you know, the guy who just through, or the woman through will, you know, kind of breaks the odds and mm-hmm. makes it. And what's fascinating to me is the other 999 who didn't, mm-hmm. what's their story? Right. Uh, and that's that's always kind of interesting to me. I'm even at this point in my life, I think, because I'm, you know, I never made it, quote unquote. I'm more interested in these stories than I was before when I was younger. Mm. But even as a 12-year-old, because I watched this movie when I was 12, Mm -hmm. I didn't feel like he, his life was a failure. I didn't, you know, I wasn't watching this thinking, oh, wow, he just ended up teaching? You know, Mm -hmm. that's not what I was feeling. I felt like, wow, he had an awesome time teaching. Maybe I want to be a teacher. That's really mm, what I thought. Yeah, good. Well, that's one of the themes of the film that I think is really important is that he comes into this job with this Mm -hmm. attitude. Mm -hmm. He's he wants to be a you know, he wants to be known for his art and for his composing. And, you know, we learn through exposition that he's been learning or sorry, that he's been working doing gigs and he doesn't want to have to do another hotel gig again, you know, and things like this. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so he takes on this teaching gig Mm -hmm. and he doesn't want to do it. So that's kind of the beginning of Mm -hmm. his character. Mm -hmm. Yeah, over the course of the film, he realizes that the thing that he is doing is the thing that he's grown to love, which is a really nice way of putting it, you know, because as artists, we, especially like we've been talking about our 20s, right? Mm -hmm. And when you're in your 20s, you have all these ambitions for what you want to do. And then you kind of settle into something that you enjoy and, and something where you're having 
an impact. And this is definitely mm-hmm. a story about that. Right. What were your your first impressions of this movie? Because I can go into my first impressions of this movie and then um, how I revisited it, how I felt when I saw this as an adult. So I'm curious to find out what it felt like to see this as a, a 50-year-old adult <laughs> Right. <laughs> in your case. Yeah. Um, well, it's always, you know, I've got a lot of black holes in my uh, cultural knowledge of films. There's a lot of films that I just set aside and never saw. So this is one of them. And watching it, you know, you feel very, you very much feel the 1995 mm. thing going on with the film. I think there was a lot of these kind of movies where, you know, it's kind of the epic. It's it's the epic of right. one person and you see them age over time and you mm-hmm. see all of the makeup. It's hard not to think of films like Forrest Gump. I, I definitely thought of Forrest Gump. Yeah. And, and sort of the journey of this of this one man, you know, which is so common. Um, so I think it was it's kind of a, a common thing that was happening with films during this period of time. Of course, a lot of these films were very successful. Mm. And so, you know, then the studio wants, you know, they're willing to take on a film like this. They've kind of faded. I think as Mm. the, um, you know, especially recently, you don't really see that many films about the white man from, you know, age 30 to age 60 in his (laughs) life. And we follow the whole trajectory. (laughs) That's not that's not a thing we're seeing in the studios right now. <laughs> that's so true <laughs> that it is almost always a white man. I yeah. don't know. Why. I mean, you could you know, Dances with Wolves. There's so many of these films during the '90s that you can think of this kind of thing. I mean, it's never like a white woman. You know, no, it never even, is. No, yeah, it's, it's never it, a black man. It's yeah. never a Latino man. It's it's always a white man. Right. Yeah. And so at at the end when I'm watching, and I knew this was, you know, this is com- I knew that his his symphony was going to be played right. for him. I could just feel it mm-hmm. coming. You know, you can you can feel it coming just from the title of the film also. But you know, there's. I, I mean, I got quite emotional watching that. Oh, this t- this, totally. this is what films do. And yeah. I, you know, I like. I wish I could just cry in movies. Instead, I get this stupid little headache. <laughs> You know, when I, I yeah. when I'm when I'm watching these movies and it's you know, it's a beautiful headache. It's you're feeling the, the resolution of his of his life in right. a sense and his acknowledgement. Um, and of course, it all goes perfectly and everybody hits every note and things right. like that. But it is a very yeah, it is a very white man's journey that you that you don't see anymore. Um, so that's one part of it just probably out of time in that sense. You, we know we're going to get this resolution to it i mean there's so many levels that we can talk about with this film you know that the you know i'm a teacher um Mm -hmm. you know the relationships with students which we can dig into and then you know the problems of education which we can dig into and i'd like to hit these but um i'm really curious to see how 12 year old cc right compares with Mm -hmm. today's cc and watching it again this is the second time you've seen it right i think maybe i saw it once more like when I was 13 or something. Okay. Um, the reason I know that this came out in 95 and not 96 is because 95 was my last year of innocence <laughs> and, you know, just sort of not being a, a teenage nightmare brat. Because by 96, I was 13 and I was so cynical that I never would have watched this movie and not laughed. Now, I don't take music as seriously as I did back then. When I was 12, I was I was playing the flute. <laughs> mm-hmm. I was playing... Wait, I yeah. didn't know this. I'm learning this right now. <laughs> Do, can you still play the flute? I mean, I, I'm sure I know how to like make a sound. and mm-hmm. I, I know how to play maybe like a couple of tunes, but it's not going to sound right. right. But yeah, I was really serious about it, you know, because I was like... I loved the idea. I mean, I loved music and it was a very pure love for music itself. Mm -hmm. I always wanted to sing. And back then it was sort of, I didn't know what I would sing and I didn't know like how I would go about it because it was kind of like frowned upon to want to be a pop star. Like that's never a thing that parents like. That's never something that's respected. Even with your peers, if you say like, oh, I want to be a pop singer, like they look at you like, why do you think that you could do this? Like, you know, it's just sort of something that you, that I was very ashamed of. Um, So when I saw that there was a way to be a musician, to actually be a singer or whatever, without the delusions of grandeur, Mm -hmm. I I thought, maybe I want to be a music teacher, because that way I would spend, I would be allowed to spend all day talking about it and playing it and Mm -hmm. doing all this stuff that I wanted to do. And so there's some, there's an innocence to that. It's like, you know, music is not a vehicle to become famous or rich, it's right. just the act of it 
you know, loving it, appreciating it and playing it. Something you feel. Being immersed in it. Yeah, totally. That I wanted. Yeah. And that feeling came back to me when I was watching this movie. I was mm. like, oh, I, maybe I don't have to be a prodigy. I could just be a music teacher. And mm. the reason I thought so is because I thought that he was doing very important work. You know, to me, it was very obvious that he was making a and making a huge difference in the lives of, right. you know, young people. And he was, he got to perform, you know, like, you know, if you conduct a school you know, concert, like you have your orchestra. People don't get to do that in any context, right? but you get to do that if you're a teacher. You, the school gives you the resources and the kids have to follow you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so you get to sort of like act out these fantasies in a weird way. But it can also be incredibly painful um, because sure what the can. film does so well is the early uh, lack of interest mm-hmm. and, and sort of they're very distracted. They're falling asleep in class. Right. Um, and this is something you always have to face as a teacher. Those early sessions with the kids, you know, listening to just how horrible it sounded. I don't think I could ever be a music teacher because I just couldn't deal with mm, mm-hmm. the lack of perfection. Right, but this right. is maybe a fantasy of the movie as well. That's what I yeah, was going to say. Yeah, because as an adult, I'm looking at this and thinking, well, that was easy. Everything was so easy. Everything was very Every easy in the film. I thought this as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, everything went 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 perfectly. Um, and he, you know, he molded the program mm-hmm. into his own image. He had this beautiful classroom yeah. that you're never going to see today. You know, it had a stage and it had the orchestra there, and everyone's good. And and all of a sudden, magically, everyone's willing right. and respectful. I mean, I think there's some reality to that. You know, he gains a reputation by sort of you know dropping his stringent mm-hmm. attitude. And I've felt this in the classroom too. That when I break away from being too strident in the classroom and just let it happen more organically Mm -hmm. that the kids respond to it more and they can feel you know one of his turning points is when his boss the uh, the dean comes to him and says you've got the knowledge you just don't have the compass Mm -hmm. that was kind of a turn for him i think but i thought that was kind of the end of act one yes definitely um so he had to turn and then all of a sudden things started to magically fall into place so yeah i i caught on to that as well so i think um for those of you who haven't seen the movie i should paint a broad picture of what is going on in the movie the the basic plot i think it it spans throughout three decades right from it starts around 1965 i believe yeah was it 66 65 66 and then it ends in 1995 so 30 years. Another Forrest Gump right. type right. span. Right. And this man is a music teacher in Portland, Oregon. That There are historical events weaved into the story, inevitably, like the Vietnam War, uh, the death of John Lennon, and etc. And there are also sort of these characteristics of the, the kids, the students, high school students, how they react to the teaching there's also a pop music history element to the whole movie. Yeah, and he shifts from Bach to mm-hmm. rock and roll. Right. He, you know, he, he's like, Louie Louie, you know, mm-hmm. the song, mm-hmm. um, He, you know, he's like, this is just three chords, why do you... And he does this through one of his students who's having difficulty learning mm-hmm. her instrument, and she's about ready to give up. So he plays Louie Louie to her, and he asks her, why does... Why is this a good song and something like it because it feels good or something like that? Because it's fun. Because it's fun. That's it. Yeah. And rock and roll in 1966, we learn, was considered the devil's music. It was. And it was, was it banned in schools? No, I don't. I, well, I don't know. Um, yeah, you wouldn't know. Yeah, I don't know. But parents were afraid of it. Right. They were was afraid. it like gangster rap in the 90s? Yeah, I think so. I mean, you know, and... I guess this happens with every generation, but it was there was something radically different with electronic music that, mm-hmm. that started happening in the 60s. So it did seem kind of dangerous to these more conservative parents who thought music was classical music and then, right. um, you know, folk music, jazz music. So here comes this rock and roll. And, and I think that that's true, that it, it was um, resisted by more traditional, you know, mm-hmm. fi- 40s and 50s post-war parents. Mm, I see. So I want to go to, there are different things that I really want to talk about. One of them that I think is a, is a very, very important, it's a pivotal moment in the movie is that um, he has a son, right? Right. His wife gets pregnant and basically that's why he stays in this teaching job right. for longer than he expected because he, I think he was about to quit. He was going to quit after a year or something. Four years, yeah, I think. Yeah, for four years, yeah. But he ends up staying at this job. 
because his wife gets pregnant, they move to the suburbs. It was a huge move that they made. They bought a house. Yeah, they bought a house and they really settle into this like Americana a nuclear family existence with him at his job mm-hmm. and she's you know the housewife the housewife so they settle into this existence and he even starts to enjoy his job yeah like he starts to like really he's accepted this and he's well but the it. two become into conflict right so that conflict seems to have been resolved but then we find out that the son is deaf right and this sort of creates the new conflict. This is what I meant by the conflict. So what what starts to develop is the husband and wife were a unit, right? Mm-hmm. And the problem was the job. Then he starts to enjoy the job, and then the family unit comes to intercept. What I don't understand and what I, I've always wanted to ask this question to anybody who's, I guess, not a man. I, I don't know if it's a man thing. I can't thing. help you there. Okay. <laughs> I don't know if it's a man thing or... Because for me, it's just, I just don't get it. I never understood why he took it so personally that his son was deaf. I, I felt like he was very mean about it yeah. to his son, like almost as if it was his fault. Like he was snapping at his son for like... He was resentful yeah, of, he was of him coming resentful. in of it because this, the son comes to interject into the situation. So I think this hits at one of the things that's a key thing in any musician's mm-hmm. life or any artist's mm-hmm. life is the idea of pursuing the work Mm -hmm. and pursuing the art Mm -hmm. or pursuing the family because they come into conflict. And this is classically with men. Beauvoir writes about this Mm -hmm. in The Second Sex, right? The idea of a man's transcendence and that sort of thing. Mm, So there's something that survives beyond the man and his his sense of legacy, Mm. you know, in this very kind of traditional man-woman kind of relationship. Mm -hmm. And so... The son can take over the heritage of the father, right? And so then it's like, oh, okay, I can let go of this great work of art that I'm doing and focus on my job and do my job well because my son is going to take over my heritage and continue my heritage. Is that really a thing? It's very in the much male a thing. It's very, it really is a thing. I think okay. it is, yeah. Maybe less so now. I mean, I don't know. But, you know, that, that's a very 1990s, I think, idea. Mm. And so when he finds out that his son is deaf, you know, psychologically, he doesn't know why that bothers him. Mm, but I the see, reason why yeah. it bothers him is because his son cannot carry his heritage right. on. And I think that this is an unconscious thing that men deal with. I mean, I, I just couldn't understand why he couldn't just separate the two. You know, his son, his his music and the fact that music was his life and his son being deaf. I, for me, I because, was... Because now there's three things he has to deal with. Okay. He has to deal with the problems of his son. And, and the problems of the family. Right. He has his job, and then he has his art. So before, I think he was willing to give up the art for the son and the family. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's why he became a good teacher. Mm-hmm. But now the son becomes the object of his failure, in a sense. It becomes the psychological right. object of his failure. So I think that's why it affects him, you know, on this psychological level that he can't deal with. And right. that's, that's, the, that's really the arc of the family in that situation, the family and the artist... But, you know, why why this happens, I think it's the idea that, you know, of what are you going to continue on? What What is going to continue on after your death? And it's interesting to ask the question or to just think about the idea as, as to, is this a male thing more than, than it is for women? Yeah. Right? Yes. But then it, you can't essentialize. Right. Every woman is going to be different. Every man is going to be different. Definitely. But are there, you know, kind of tendencies, you know, that right. are programmed into us, which is Beauvoir's idea that these yes. are kind of conditional elements that get programmed into us. And it's very much programmed into this family. Mm-hmm. She's the traditional stay-at-home mother. Mm-hmm. Um, she doesn't have any capacity for transcendence. And I often think about this mm-hmm. when I'm watching movies. Mm-hmm. How are they going to present the woman in this film, right? Because it's his film. So how is the wife going to be? Mm-hmm. And it fell into the traditional situation of the the stay-at-home wife while the man goes and figures out his shit. And then she has to be the one to hold down the family and be the supporter of the values of the family. Mm-hmm. And she has to push this on him uh, so that he deals with this. And so these two streams kind of come together. Actually, these three streams, I guess, if you think family, job, art, for him, it all gets resolved in the end. Yes, definitely. Right. Yeah, Relatively easily. 
Yeah, it's Compared a magical to, 90s movie. Yeah, it's it's one of those very optimistic 90s movies where everybody has a house. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and a job and a car <laughs> and, and a happy family, right? Right. And nobody um, loses their mortgage. <laughs> Right. This was before all of that happens. Right. Right. And so this was sort of a magical time. And so, you know, I said it was a cute movie after it, after we watched it. I was like, well, that was a very cute movie. For me, I was, I got a little teary eyed. Yeah. Because of a certain nostalgia that I felt towards yes. this time. Right. I thought maybe we should talk about some of the individual characters. We've talked about the family. We've mm-hmm. talked about the tension with the family and the art and the job. Um, maybe we could get into some of these relationships with the students mm-hmm. and him. Because there were a few key students. There were a few interesting cameos. Mm-hmm. So there was, is it Terrence Blanchard? Is that his No, name? babe. Oh, he's a gen. <laughs> that's right. He's <laughs> <laughs> Terrence Howard. Terrence Howard. And then who we thought was Forrest Whitaker, but we're not sure if maybe it was, maybe it was a different name for the same actor, or maybe it was his brother. We never figured that out. Right. Somebody who looked a lot like Forrest Whitaker and whose name, whose last name turned out to be Whitaker. Yeah, but with a different first name. Right. But if it was him, he looked younger than he did in Fast Times at Ridgemont High, which was before that. It's yeah, kind of that, so maybe he's a brother. Yeah, I don't know. Or a relation, yeah. Right. Because he looked younger than Terrence Howard, and that can't be right. Yeah, Terrence Howard strangely looked 25 years old. That's true. Really good-looking guy. Every time oh, I he, see him I in a film, he's thought, so good-looking. Yeah, he, but he's always the good-looking bad guy. Right. It was, it was, I thought it was, I don't know what you thought of the fact that Terrence Howard had no rhythm Mm -hmm. at all. This, okay, so this struck me as very odd as an adult. When I was a kid, I didn't think anything of it. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm a drummer. Nobody has rhythm that bad. It's, it's it's kind of impossible to have rhythm that bad. And to see this Mm -hmm. young, bright looking black student Mm -hmm. (laughs) to to be taught by this old white dude how to dance and how to move his feet and how to to find the downbeat. I thought that was a little weird too. Yeah, Yeah. I don't know. I don't know what to make of that. Because Um, it was so exaggerated too. It's not not just because he's a young black man, but... (laughs) It was so exaggerated. It was so exaggerated even for just, you know, just for any person, right? Right. And there's this really just bright-eyed Terrence Howard... (laughs) Who's just so positive, willing to work hard, willing to listen to his teachers, you know, uh, this is the 1960s, so kids are kind of different, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> like they, they have less distractions, they're willing to work hard, you know, and joins the marching band, and then when his father sees him playing the drums in the marching band, he's so proud, everybody's so proud of him, and then eventually... A few years later, it turns out that he dies in the war. Right. right? And so there's a tie-in with the Vietnam War, which is another kind of Forrest Gump kind of Uh thing where there's a lot of newsreel footage and Mm -hmm. a lot of the historical elements through television media brought back in. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we learn just through the face of the father who we'd seen before so happy, then so mournful that that he died. And, you know, that's one of those plot elements where, I mean, it was a two hour and 20 minute film, Mm -hmm, I think. mm -hmm. That could have been taken out, actually. That could Mm -hmm. have wound up on the editing room floor. Right, right. It was popular at this time to sort of draw in these aspects of I don't know why in the 90s there was Oliver Stone doing a lot of films yes uh, Born on the Fourth of July and Uh Platoon and things like this there was a couple of Vietnam War movies Mm -hmm. that were competing for Best Picture in the same year Um, that might have been in the late 80s I can't remember but around this time the Vietnam War seemed to be a big deal and so it sort of got wrapped into the screenplay somehow but yeah that was interesting Mm mm-hmm the most recent war wars are become important, I think, like oh, a generation a later, yeah. because for us, it was the Gulf War. That's right. So the Gulf and, War was happening around the same yeah. time, and we we're making some parallels then. Right, right. Why don't we um, talk about some of the other characters? So there's the, there's the girl, we kind of mentioned her before, Miss Lang, who can't play the clarinet. Mm-hmm. And so he is, again, initially frustrated with her, but then he takes her on. Mm -hmm. And we talked about her a little bit. But then, again, one of these, sort of like the Terrence Howard uh, character, another student comes in who is a singer. So the the theater department and the music department department decide to get together on a uh, final Gershwin review. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not a show in particular, 
It's not a show with music written by Gershwin. It's like a bunch of famous songs from famous Gershwin tunes together in one show. And so you you have the songs that were reoccurring were um, like the one in Music Man, I got rhythm, I got music. And then there's someone to watch over me. Um, and then there's the way you in your head. Mm-hmm, the mm-hmm. Way. So those three tunes were, um, they were being played and rehearsed continuously. And then out of the blue comes this very talented mm-hmm. student who can sing. Mm-hmm. She just appears on stage. Mm-hmm. And then she takes the lead. Mm -hmm. He takes her under his wing and she's very pretty. Mm -hmm. And they, you know, he's coaching her. And there's the scene when he says to her, someone to watch over me. He says to her, when you sing the words, I don't remember exactly what it is, but it's basically conveying the depth of love. Yeah, longing. That's what I was going to say. So the depth of love love in this longing or absent sense and she's supposed to feel that Mm -hmm. now this is a girl who's probably yeah yeah this is a girl who's probably 17 years old right 18 years old max 17 well 17 because yeah because i think she was a junior actually when they were talking in the diner i think she had one right right anyway um that scene when you're watching that Mm -hmm. scene you're like "Uh uh-oh yeah right Mm -hmm. because she responds to him Mm -hmm. this is an interesting dynamic especially if you're teaching arts and Mm -hmm. you're teaching expressive things or you're teaching any kind of poetic or literature or something like that or music in this Mm -hmm. case where it becomes a very emotional thing and and um you know then then it creates this bond between the student and the teacher that is you know very important Mm -hmm. for nurturing and, you know, taking on somebody, but then can lead to dangerous places. Mm -hmm. And it does. I mean, you know, he's he's the older, wiser, you know, Mm -hmm. teacher. She's impressionable. Mm -hmm. She's a fantastic singer. And then it seems like she's falling for him. Yeah. Well, I let me ask you this. I have been on I have been that young student singer, like literally. I've mm-hmm. been totally been on the other side, and you've been on the you know yeah, I'm sure you've been the teacher. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Weird, but <laughs> but I I want to know why that situation, why that kind of thing is dangerous for you guys. I know exactly what the younger person is thinking because we know the power and influence we have over the person. I see. Who so it's basically the same thing. Okay, yeah. got it. Yeah. So this was a difference between, because I taught in the States before I came to Korea. Mm-hmm. And in the States, when you're teaching college students, you have to be very hands-off and very objective. Mm-hmm. And then I came to Korea and, you know, it was like, well, you have to pay more attention to the individual students. You know, it's a learning experience, you know, and, and you don't want to favor somebody against, you know, over mm-hmm. somebody else. But in a lot of ways, it seems like that doesn't matter. But then, yeah, you're in a position of power. You're you're in a position of, of influence and you know that. And, you know, that can be taken advantage of. Mm-hmm. So you have to be aware of that when you're teaching. Because if you're doing arts, there's a passion to the arts, right? right? right, right. Uh, and how much do you try to draw that out of the student mm-hmm. while maintaining your distance that you need to have? So that never becomes an exact thing, you know. We see situations where that power is abused Mm -hmm. and we see situations, many situations probably where there isn't the encouragement of the student and there isn't the intimacy with the student Mm -hmm. because of the concern about that. Mm -hmm. This is, you know, this is the difficult Mm -hmm. situation of a teacher to be in. So when he gets to the point where he has to make a choice, right, and she invites him, she decides to quit school. She I has thought to quit. she's. I thought she was graduating. I don't think and then, she was. Okay, okay. Because he was it. like, "Wait, yeah. I'm, I didn't say go right now." Oh, got it, got it. So she decides to just bail because if she doesn't go now, she's going to become a waitress. So she says, "Come with me and write music and be with me." And it's like, "Oh my God, this is you know." First of all, this is like the temptation of Jesus on the cross <laughs> to go back down to earth, you know, and mm-hmm. and take you know mm-hmm. the carnal, mm-hmm. lustful life, right? right. And so he could abandon his family, who he's having a hard time with, Mm -hmm. and run off with this young girl. And he goes and he meets her and he he shows up and we don't know. I mean, we know what he's going to do. He's going to do the right thing. But there's a moment between them that I don't think you could do today. I think the producers would say, no, you got to change that scene where he kisses her Mm 
Mm-hmm. It's not on the cheek. It's not on the mouth. It's kind of in between. Yeah. And I don't think that would fly today. Mm, I don't know. I spent most of my adult life in France, and people do that all the time. <laughs> yeah, but that's France. This yeah. Is, this is the state. So I don't know it in a, how that would go about in America. Like, is is that? I think it's inappropriate. It's inappropriate. Yeah. Okay. But then there's also this thing of they have a close relationship, and so you he can't just say bye. But that was a private moment. Though. Yeah. True. Yeah. So he could basically do whatever he wants. But with mobile phones and cameras, right, and right, everything, okay. if he's he would never do that if he's caught. Well, yeah, there's an there would be another story if it if that totally. moved, yeah then it becomes you know a Title Nine or something mm-hmm. like that kind of situation. You know, one one thing I was thinking like, you know, the movie could I don't think that that movie would have ever gone in the direction of him going. Mm-hmm. So he does the right thing. But this again kind of goes to what we were saying about this is his, he's the hero of the film. Mm, yeah, and the hero of the film couldn't possibly make a mistake like that. Mm-hmm. I think if this was a Netflix TV series, right. first of all, we would have probably had two episodes before this film mm-hmm. that you know shows his background and his family background and shows him as a musician and stuff like that. But he actually goes with her. Mm-hmm. So in 2021, I think it's possible that he actually makes the decision to go with her. Absolutely, because the subject matter is so lame that you would have to make it scandalous in Netflix 2021. Right. Yeah. You don't... Who wants to see a show about a high school music teacher doing the right thing nobody like right. literally nobody i guarantee you nobody would watch it if it had been pitched in 2021 people would be laughing at whoever pitched this right um so no it would have to go towards a really dark direction of him not only going with her but you know god knows what else should be added to. yeah if it was a netflix show mm-hmm. post breaking bad post game of thrones the anti-hero yeah ozark you know like yeah the, those middle-aged man doing exactly. illegal things kind of or theme. um unseemly things yeah and then somehow redeeming themselves or somehow winning <laughs> yeah yeah you know that sometimes yeah. there's no redemption yeah but yeah i just thought that that was a very 1995 it was totally stamp. yeah totally i don't know yeah. what did you think about the connection between those two characters um, I, yeah, I it probably it went the, exactly the way it would have gone if it were to happen in real life in 1980, because this setting was in 1980. This happened in 1980. But like, you know, also like I've had weird dynamics with my teachers and that's exactly how it went. Like, you know, I never pursued them. I never invited them to run away with me, but nothing came about, obviously. I mean, not obviously. Some people actually do have affairs with their teachers, but I never really did, except for once when I was an adult. <laughs> but, you know, when I was younger, it never came into fruition. Whereas I frequently had that kind of weird tension with music teachers specifically. Well, again, I think it's the yeah. arts. Yeah. And, you know, he was kind of looking at her in a certain way when she was singing. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. But, but that's what I mean is I think one of the other interesting things about the film is, you know, when I when I teach students mm-hmm. and I see them thriving and succeeding, mm-hmm. I get incredibly emotional about mm-hmm. it. Yeah, yeah. And it almost moves me to tears. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, there is a there's an intimacy with students, and this, yes. you know, the way that he was looking at her while she was performing mm-hmm. must have been very conflicting for him, mm-hmm. because also she represents the life that he left behind, the pure yes, artist. Yes, absolutely. And she probably interpreted that in a certain way, because the way he was looking at her was probably very complex. Absolutely. You know, the way we look at people, the youth. It's very complex. It's not always just desire or love. It's it's a very complex emotion, right? It's like, yeah, the life that he left behind, youth, right. potential possibilities. There's so many things that she represents, right? In also, it could be a little bit of the daughter that he, totally. that the son can't be. Right. You know? Yeah, I, I totally thought that too yeah. when I was watching that scene because um, his son is deaf mm-hmm. and He's never had a gifted student thus far right. presented in the movie like that, right? Mm-hmm, there were no mm-hmm. like gifted music students. Except the clarinet player who succeeded, but that was a different... Not in music, though. I mean, she became the governor, but she wasn't like a gifted yeah, yeah, musician. Right. Right. So that kind of moment was probably a very complex emotion that very he was complex, feeling. Think, yeah. And for her, oh my God, when you are 17... When you are a 17-year-old girl... It's not complicated. You should not be allowed to do anything. You don't know what the hell... You know, you see a man and he's like vaguely... Like, he's nice to you. 
and he is telling you that you have potential and you can be you can go to New York and fulfill your dreams. And so she probably doesn't get any support for her music at home. Well, the father wants her to yeah. maintain the store. Yeah, exactly. So this person is the first person that she's ever met in her life who is encouraging her to do the one thing that she really loves. It's not just that he's a person though. It's a it's a daddy replacement. Oh, totally. Yeah, yeah. It's the approving father. Yeah, it's the approving father that she always sort of wanted and never had. Right. And Ooh, if I had that when I was 17, I would have been the same. I would have done the same thing. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't mean that it's less conflicting for her, but I think it's more... His emotions are very complicated. Yeah. For her, I think, you know, when you're 17 years old, oh my God, you're like yeah. an arrow. Yeah. And you like any boy, any guy that gives you any attention. I'm sorry, but like, you know, it's, <laughs> I was so susceptible to so many things back then. Like, you know, and yeah. I would actually... I think I was like this until I was like a good 27. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it was just very obvious why she felt the way she felt Mm -hmm. to me. Mm -hmm. It was obvious back then and it's still obvious to Mm -hmm. me right now. But what I I will tell you now as a 38-year-old woman is that she went to New York that night. Two days later, I guarantee you, she forgot all totally. about Mr. Holland. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I almost want to say she forgot when she got on the bus because yeah. the, there was a sweet little look. Yeah. And he kind of, you know, <laughs> did a nod mm-hmm. and, and her you could see her face kind mm-hmm. of change. And mm-hmm. I, I thought what she did actually was a beautiful moment of acting yeah. there, getting on just getting on the bus. She was an incredible actress yeah, and yeah. an incredible singer. This actress, I don't know who she yeah, is. I don't know who she is either. Yeah. Never saw her again, but her mm. her singing voice was incredible. Movies about music. I sort of want to talk about something that I want us to, you know, usually kind of at least cover is we talked about the idea of the authenticity of the music and the way the music's presented. Um, did you have any thoughts on that? Because there's a, a variety of styles done right. and then also the way that they were done mm-hmm. in the film. I'll just mention one thing. Um, Michael Kamen, I, I saw Michael Kamen in the credits. Okay. And he was the hot film score mm. guy in the late 80s into the 90s. Like he did Lethal Weapon. He did like all of the major, you know, he did a lot of work with, you know, there was a period of time when David Sanborn and Eric Clapton and these guys were doing film scores. He also worked with Pink Floyd but he's um, he's a well-known film composer. And I thought early in the film, we see Richard Dreyfuss' character playing the piano. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he's playing the piano, but then you hear the strings. Mm. There's this idea of diegetic music, which is the music in the film, mm. non-diegetic music, which is the score, which is outside of the mm-hmm. characters. So there was a mixture going on. Mm-hmm. So when he's playing the piano, it's in the film, he's playing the piano, but then Michael came and adds these strings to it. Mm-hmm which makes what he's doing more grandiose than it is. Yeah. And then you see him get up and step away from the piano and the and Michael Kamen's score mm-hmm. is still playing. I just love that. You know, I love mm-hmm. little moments mm-hmm. like that. In this sense, the music is capturing the emotion mm-hmm. rather than materially necessarily mm-hmm. real in the film, but it's what he's feeling. It's He's hearing it in his head. So I thought that was quite beautiful. I thought that that is also something that was done in the 90s a lot Mm. for this type of music uh, Mm -hmm. movies yeah i think so for me i felt like a lot of the music was very believable like the marching band sounded like a high school marching band you know the student orchestra in the end at the end sounded somewhat like a student orchestra like a very good one but you know really good yeah but it, it was it was believable because i hate it when music movies do this to us where they we have to pretend that it's good or that it's, you know, somewhat not amazing for the sake of the plot. Like, I hate it when directors make us make this our responsibility as the audience to pretend that this is somehow amazing when it's not. Mm. Um, I can think of various examples for this, but I won't get into it. I know what you mean. But the singing of, you know, the, the singer girl, Rowena, mm. her singing was very good. Mm-hmm. But it's it made sense in the whole story. It's yeah, like, so. okay, yeah, she has to be that good for him to be that blown away and yeah. everybody, yeah. Mm-hmm. And for her to have this conflict in right. her life. Right. What about things like the uh, popular music that they incorporated? Yeah, I thought it was interesting because to gloss over the sort of like the, the decades, they mentioned certain artists, right? So Gershwin was mentioned, obviously. And then he had that little anecdote about John Coltrane, right? About how he hated John Coltrane. And then he listened to it and listened to it until he couldn't stop playing it. And now he loves it. 
And so that was a huge moment in his life. And John Coltrane was never mentioned again, but there was a poster of Love Supreme. That. Yeah. yeah, it suddenly appeared yeah. in the classroom. And then there was also that in the 60s, he wasn't allowed to incorporate rock and roll music in the curriculum that was mentioned because it was considered the devil's music. Mm-hmm. And then the death of John Lennon was a huge moment, right? And so for me, it might have been a coincidence, but I feel like somebody asked the writer or the director, like, who are the three most important people in music, American music? Oh, interesting. You know what I mean? And so that's kind of what he came up with. Well, so we had Bach. Mm-hmm. Coltrane, mm-hmm. Lennon, mm-hmm. those three? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe, you know, they, they are supposed to be the most influential right. musicians, I guess. Mm-hmm. Of It's a pretty good trio, isn't it? Yeah. There's also talk of Beethoven, and that scene when he talks about Beethoven conducting the orchestra mm-hmm. when he's deaf. It's actually a movie called Immortal Beloved, which you I've might want to do. Yeah. yeah, I've seen it too. And yeah. it, it does that scene that he's talking about, but it's the ninth, not the seventh. Mm-hmm. I think you're probably right that the script writers Mm -hmm. love the music that they love and they throw it in there. Or they just thought, oh, these are the most influential musicians of the past. Yeah, that's what I I don't know. Yeah, Mm -hmm. and and that to me was a really mainstream choice. (laughs) Yeah. There's also the question in education of how much you want to appeal to the students' needs and the students' interests. Because this is what turns him, right? He starts off, I mean, first of all, he's a very boring teacher when he starts. Um, And he's talking about Bach. But then he rolls it over to um, popular music at the time. And that's what gets him into trouble, as you were saying. So there's this desire to appeal to the students. And that's kind of what I think gives him the ability to express the idea of joy in music. Mm -hmm. There's one thing that I wanted to address, which is a lot of people say, you know, there's that saying, those who can't do teach or whatever. Yeah, we should probably talk about this. And I never believed that Mm -hmm. because um, it it just doesn't make any sense to me. Um, But he believed it, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. And there's this, is is this sort of like perpetuated by the media or something? Because I know in reality that that's not true. Mm -hmm. It's just simply not true. If anything, a teaching position in the arts, it's really, really hard to come by. Like it's in music. If you want to be like a university level instructor of anything you're probably at the top of your game it's true you have to have some accomplishments Mm -hmm. and even high school to become a high school music teacher i'm telling you my friend who got a master's in music theory which is an incredibly hard thing to do it's an incredibly difficult thing to do they take like maybe five music theory students a year It was an incredibly difficult, like to become a choir conductor at a church even. That is an incredibly difficult thing to do. You have to have so much training, a really good ear, and you have to be an accomplished musician. You have to have really dedicated yourself your entire life to the craft. Can you think of any examples of like people who couldn't do So they ended up teaching because I can't. Well, there's probably different kind of different levels of this. But at the best universities, I mean, they're going to be the best. And then in the mid-level, they're going to be Mm mid-level. I mean, that's kind of the way it goes. But teaching is its own craft. You know, there's the moment at the end when, and this is what almost made me cry, Mm -hmm. is when the clarinet student, Mm -hmm. who's now the governor or mayor. Yes, the governor. The governor says, we are your notes or Mm -hmm. something like that of your music. Yeah. And that was really a beautiful, beautiful speech. Yeah, thing it was a say. beautiful f- speech. Yeah. And that's really the trajectory of the film, I think. And the trajectory for him is that kind of recognition. Mm. Yes. That he did compose his opus. Right. Not just not in the way that he thought he was right. going to. And right. I think that was really the beautiful yeah. thing in the film. One last thing that I wanted to talk about is before the big grand scene at the end, mm-hmm. when they do his opus, he gets called into the principal's office Mm -hmm. and he gets told by the principal Mm -hmm. that the arts are going to be completely cut. Art, drama, and music. Right. And so he's obviously upset about this. And then he says, what's the line that Mr. Holland says back to him? Well, it's important to reiterate the line of the principal, which was, if I have the choice between long division reading and writing and Mozart, I would choose long division and reading and writing. And so Mr. Holland says, you can cut the arts and pretty soon these kids will have nothing to read and write about. Right. They'll have nothing. And that, Mm -hmm. that line 
that just rings to me, you know, obviously this movie is 1995, but that rings to me as so contemporary. Mm -hmm. Um, And just in my teaching, what I find is there's so much at the university level where, you know, there's so much driven towards basically capitalism, towards getting a job, towards job placement and that sort of thing. And I'm in the job of teaching storytelling, filmmaking and, and things like that. I've always wondered, he just said the line perfectly, just like you said it. Like, if they don't have any experience, what are they going to make? Mm-hmm. And this was done in 1995, and you see it just getting worse and worse right. today. Um, that was such a great line, and I think it's something that speaks to something that you and I both believe in, which is the value of creativity and the value of arts. Well, it's become kind of cliche, hasn't it? Like you said, it's been getting progressively worse mm-hmm. since the 90s. And now we're living in an age where... These algorithms are teaching us what to read. Totally. <laughs> well, yeah, and they're what even to reading do. for yeah. us. They're like reading <laughs> text for us. And so we, you know, people go to schools to develop these algorithms. Yeah. And it, it's just becoming, it's getting weird. It is getting weird. You, yeah. you, in our first podcast, you had talked about ABBA and sort of the automation of ABBA. Mm-hmm. It's, yeah, it's things are getting creepy. It's like, it's like the whole idea of learning you know, learning an instrument, learning notes and, and going through that process. And then also just the experience with other people, uh-huh. right? Which is something I think in the pandemic we're sort of losing out on is the experience of being with other people in creativity. Well, I was like in middle school in the 90s, middle school and high school in the 90s. And I don't know if it's, I don't know if it started with my generation. I but, think you were right on the cusp of it, actually. Yeah, because there was this reoccurring theme of picking a major that will get you a job. I suffered from this, this rhetoric for years afterwards. Like, mm. it was just like, even after I graduated university, there was like, oh, you can still kind of like pick something, mm-hmm. um, you know, these jobs that you can get. And then like web designer was a big one. Yeah, right. Web designing, coding and all that. And a bunch of us went into these fields without wanting to do it or having any talent in it whatsoever Mm. because they were supposed to get us these jobs that will guarantee us income. And guess what? It didn't. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Was this when you were in in college? Yeah. So in Korea. Yeah. Yeah. But even in America, there was this idea of like, get into, if you become an actuary scientist, you will always have a job. That's not true anymore. Right, true. And so now I don't know what the fuck we're doing. I don't know. What would you tell the kids today to study? I mean, for me, it would be study what you like doing. Mm -hmm. For my part, if you learn how to tell a story, you're going to be able to get jobs Mm -hmm. in anything. It's always kind of bothered me a little that Korean students very frequently will study English. Mm Mm-hmm. And it's like, okay, you're studying English, Mm -hmm. but what, what what are you contributing? It just seems like that's kind of a... I don't know. That seems to me very formulaic. Maybe not. Maybe that's something where it will get you into kind of like studying storytelling. It will get you into other areas and it will be applied to other areas. Well, I've been telling young people one thing and one thing only, and I will stand by this until I die. Don't listen to your parents. Don't listen to us. We don't know anything about anything. Yeah. And we will most likely be wrong about everything because it's your it's their future it's their life Mm -hmm. and they will have to live it right it's true they they're gonna have to build the world that they live in they will make the decisions that will shape their own futures and we will not be part of it and we need to we won't even know we we won't won't even know what the hell is going on yeah it's kind of a weird disconnect so to bring it back Mm -hmm. to the film it i think you know one of the things that happens is he comes around to rock and roll right Mm -hmm. so he comes around to understanding what these kids are going through and that's probably an important lesson too for educators i think Yeah, and I would say don't listen to us except for things that are universal, age-old wisdom that you can only have when you're older. Those Mm -hmm. things, I think it's worth getting advice from your teachers and your parents. Yeah, when it comes to what you're going to do with your life and what your career is going to be and what you're going to learn and what you should be focusing on, that is, I think, entirely up to the Mm -hmm. child or the student, I think. I think so, too. Yeah, it's it's hard because they get a lot of pressure from parents and parents are telling them to go into this field and this field. I was just talking to a student the other the other day Mm -hmm. um, who's in Australia. Mm -hmm. I taught her in China and her parents kind of forced her into this major and she didn't want to do it. She was interested in filmmaking. And sure enough, she goes through the major, she finishes and now she wants to go to grad school back in the thing that she originally loved Mm -hmm. that her parents talked her out of. 
eventually they're going to, you know, kids are going to find their own way, I think. Well, a lot of these kids who are micromanaged by their parents end up wasting a lot of money and a lot of time, mm, that's myself true. included. <laughs> and uh, I didn't waste too much time or money, but it could have been a lot worse. Mm -hmm. And it, the, for those who don't push back, they end up not doing anything. You got to let your kids, I mean, I don't have kids, so I guess it's, it could sound cavalier that I say this, but you gotta let your kids live. Yeah, you gotta let them live. You gotta let them have experiences. I agree with you totally. If they if they feel like oh they you know they want they feel like bartending somewhere mm -hmm. that is a very valuable experience. Right. Yeah. Working in retail is the best education that I had ever had mm -hmm. in my life. I think to be fair, it's not just parents, is it? It's sort of like the whole super ego structure that tells you yeah. you should do this and you internalize that. Mm -hmm. That's what education is supposed to be is it's supposed to break you out of those mm -hmm. kind of mm -hmm. restrictive expectations and so that you learn new things. Mm -hmm. So on our next show, mm -hmm. I think we're going to change gears a little bit and we are going to watch the movie Hustle and Flow. Right. Which is a movie about music. Yes. Which is what we do. I've never seen that movie. I've never seen it either. Yeah, this will be cool. It'll go back to like Sound of Metal, you know, a movie that neither of us have seen before. So mm, yay. that'll be fun. So if you want to watch Hustle and Flow before our next podcast, then please do. Please do. Yes. And please leave us a positive review. Yes. Leave us a review. That would be wonderful. Not just a review, a positive review. A positive review. review. Yes, please. Yeah. A positive review. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Cece. We'll see you all next time. Bye-bye. Under the moonlight I'll sing you a song So you'd magically feel a love that's alone Hopefully they'll live eternally If we paint ourselves all bright with stories Of heroes and poets and sadness and war of immeasurable pain, unconditional love Movies about music